Good evening and welcome again to the Icon Gallery at um, the Monastery of All Saints of North America here in Dudney, British Columbia, Canada. We had been talking about uh, the introduction to Orthodoxy and particularly about liturgical worship. But this evening I'm going to continue with the discussion I was giving today at our Theology on Tap. Well, random subjects. Um, Theology on Tap is a unique gathering that we have uh, once a month now in um, one of our better Canadian pubs in the, in the area and over a pint of ale we discuss theological questions. Most of the people who attend are evangelical Protestants and they're interested in hearing the Orthodox Christian perspective and in many cases without actually converting to Orthodoxy adopting some of these perspectives which they find far more attractive than many of those which they have been uh, raised with. So uh, I, I'm just going to discuss a few random points that we had discussed today, um, really uh, questions that were asked and, and which I answered or enlarged upon. Now, when we discussed the creation narrative in Genesis, we were talking about meaning, and we've covered some aspects of it, but I want to go back again to the story of Cain and Abel, because it is a story that in one form or another is repeated again in the scripture. And in this case, I want to talk about it as prophecy, as prophecy about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we look at the story of Cain and Abel, we realize that Cain was the eldest brother and uh, the inheritance, that is the first place, the position, the inheritance of the promise, everything was his because he was the firstborn. And yet, because uh, of his own self-centeredness and egoism, and because he became into bondage to law, he lost his inheritance by a peculiar uh, means. God did not remove his inheritance from him. He sacrificed his inheritance to his own passions. And this has a great deal to say about the advent of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. You remember that the righteous Abel offered to God from the heart. And his sacrifice was accepted because it was offered from love from the heart. Whereas Cain's sacrifice was ordered, offered according to the law. In other words, both of them fulfilled the order, the proper rubrics, the proper uh, liturgy, as it were, for making the offering. But Cain offered his because it was the law, and perhaps even begrudgingly, but evidently he did not offer from the heart. Now, in this case, Cain is a type of the old Israel, because eventually Israel had fallen, that is the leaders, the Pharisees in particular, but the Sadducees as well, had fallen into a real bondage to the law in which, although they had a better understanding, they nevertheless placed themselves under uh, the, the law itself, as if the law was the beginning and the end of the revelation and the sole purpose of their relationship with God was to fulfill the law. And many times this law was fulfilled begrudgingly, or it was fulfilled superficially, on the outside, moralistically. Rather than reflecting the condition of the heart, it simply reflected an outer self-righteousness. Cain, then, is a type of, uh, of the old Israel, the firstborn. The, the one that was chosen and placed in its position to be a, an apostle of monotheism, of the revelation of the one true God. Abel is a type of Jesus Christ, and also, in a way, a type of the New Testament church. Because when Cain sees Abel offering from the heart, and his offering received, he's Offering, of course, because it's the law, because there's an obligation. And he's seized with envy. And the revelation that he receives through 
Abel's offering being accepted only angers him, only makes him full of envy and jealousy. And so he will kill the righteous Abel, who really is the revelation of the mystery of grace, the mystery of the transfigured inner person, the transformed heart that God really has desired, that he is going to begin the move toward restoring his love relationship with God, which is what man had in paradise, an unselfish love. So this whole mystery of Cain and Abel is more than just a story about something that happened in some remote past. It really bears in it a revelation about the old covenant and people falling into a kind of self-inflicted bondage to law, even though the holy prophets in the Old Testament would constantly testify that it was the transformation of the heart. It was for people to become merciful. It was for people to begin to truly sense their spousal relationship with God and their relationship as brethren with other uh, human beings. And then when this burden of legalism had become so heavy and our Lord Jesus Christ came to try to restore the true meaning of the revelation, that is, that you're being called back toward paradise, toward that uh, relationship of unselfish love with God, where you can truly experience the joy and the love of God within you. And so the uh, killing of Abel by Cain prefigures the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and even the suffering of the New Testament church in its beginning and its foundations. But lest we, as Christians, also fall into a kind of self-righteous arrogance, this prophecy is also about us. Because now, uh, the Orthodox Church is the original Christian church. So we can say that the firstborn of Christianity. So what are we doing with that? What fruits of that position, of that reality, are we offering now to the world and to God? We also can fall into bondage to a kind of legalism and a kind of superstition as well, and not really strive for this inner transformation, this real remaking, recapitulation of our being, of our personhood in Jesus Christ. And we can also become just as arrogant and self-righteous and condescending as anyone else. So we hold the faith because it's a, a legal norm for us without this kind of transformation of our hearts. And then we fall into the same position of losing the birthright because we have not held it in our heart and offered it from our heart. So we'll continue with some of these discussions a little later. Uh, we're again running to the end of the time that's allotted. And uh, as I mentioned before, and you've noticed, the broadcast seemed to get cut off before we're quite finished speaking. So I try to say uh, a little bit that's not a part of, of, of the actual discussion in order to fill in that time so that if it gets cut off before we're finished, it does not cut off part of the actual discussion. Um, there are a few other subjects that we want to discuss that were covered today in our Theology on Tap, and those dealt with redemption and the fact that the word redemption itself is, after all, a metaphor and not a statement of some kind of concrete legal reality.